I'm actually going to speak to uh, this morning's topic of uh, what might happen when teachers and other academics connect reason to power and power to resistance. My earlier talk was about this. <laughs> this is going to be very brief. Um, irrationalism has come to dominate the political and public discourse in the form of conspiracy theory, hearsay and anecdote, propaganda, marketing fantasies, infotainment, and emotionally potent simplifications. 9-11 conspiracy plots, birth of secrets, medical conspiracy against vaccinations, secret chemicals in our drinking water causing the obesity epidemic, God's plot against homosexuals, etc. have taken on greater prominence as social and historical explanations. Research and science are treated as equivalent to rumor, speculation, and opinion unsupported by evidence and argumentation. I think Peter's got some lizard stories that would actually fit in well with that litany. <laughs> Um, corporate school reform expands irrationalism under the guise of a hyper-rationalism in which that which is deemed worthy of knowing is only that which can be numerically quantified. The crucial point is that at a time when it is imperative for citizens to understand the cultural politics and political economic forces, animating representations and undergirding claims to truth, classroom pedagogy and curriculum is being overtaken by corporate school reform and neoliberal restructuring that posits false claims to neutrality, that denies the politics of knowledge, teaching and learning. It's not just standardized testing implicated in the dangerous denial of politics, but the broader phenomenon of what I call the new market positivism at work in reducing all questions of knowledge, teaching, and learning to that which is numerically quantifiable and measurable. Recourse to numbers in the new educational context takes down the guise of science while in fact it furthers irrationalism as knowledge is decontextualized and understanding is misrepresented as a collection of a world of facts as if these facts do not require interpretive frameworks and underlying theoretical assumptions. In the context of a rising irrationalism, mysticism, and public culture dominated by image and fleeting opinion, numbers promise the allure of certainty, the suggestion of scientific solidity. The institutionalization of high-stakes standardized tests offers the promise in the sheen of solidity and certainty in a world rendered abstract through the principle of capitalist exchange applied everywhere, as Adorno uh, emphasizes. Under the sway of neoliberal ideology, the suggestion that there is no alternative to the market has produced what Mark Fisher calls market Stalinism. And I borrowed this argument from Alex Means, who's here today, um, in which audit culture reigns supreme. Such market Stalinism represents a world in which all that is solid melts into public relations. A world in which, as David Simon's television series, The Wire, accurately, accurately captured the game of juking the stats creating foremost an appearance of ever-improving numerical measures of efficiency comes to supersede reason or rationale grounded in public interest for the policies and practices of teachers and administrators, police officers, politicians, business people, and public workers. As the numbers game seeks to produce ever better numbers, the pursuit of numbers above all else results in multiple perversions of institutional values and purpose foreclosing the potential for democratic social relations. This is happening under, in public education under the guise of promoting uh, so-called market-based efficiencies by cutting through um, public sector bureaucratic red tape. One of the most important foundational metaphors for public school privatization that has been promoted since the early 1990s involves claims of the, the alleged um, natural efficiencies of markets and cutting through this bureaucratic red tape. This argument against the alleged bureaucratic inefficiencies of the public sector and for the alleged managerial efficiency of the private sector was launched in earnest by Shelvin Moe's Politics, Markets, and America's Schools in 1990. Since the publication of their neoliberal educational Bible, the debureaucratizing force of privatization has been promoted relentlessly in educational policy, despite a lack of evidence for it. Yet, corporate school reforms, rather than decreasing bureaucracy and increasing efficiencies in public schooling, have in fact vastly expanded bureaucracy and created economic and operational inefficiencies. That is, corporate school reform has produced a privatized bureaucratic infrastructure that has yet to be identified as such. Moreover, the question of expanding or shrinking bureaucracy to a great extent conceals the ways that corporate school reforms achieve the redistribution of control and governance over policy and practice, curriculum and administration, as well as the redistribution of control over educational resources by creating a new two-tiered system, privatized at the bottom, and undermining the public and critical possibilities of public schools. <coughs> The new market bureaucracy in public schooling can be divided into at least three categories for conceptual clarity. First, the new market bureaucracy involves the shift 
to what I'm calling the new market positivism, that is, numerically quantifiable performance outcomes and the bureaucratic apparatuses put in place to control teachers, administrators, and students, and to transform curriculum and pedagogy. The new market positivism still neutralizes, naturalizes, and universalizes the reproduction of the class order through schooling, as positivism did during the Fordist era of the hidden curriculum. But the new market positivism also openly naturalizes and universalizes a particular economic basis for all educational relationships, schooling for work, schooling for economic competition, schooling for consumption, while justifying a shift in governance control and ownership over educational institutions to private parties. Secondly, the new market bureaucracy involves linking the new market positivism to the institutionalization and the funding of entirely new strata of bureaucratic organizations dedicated to furthering the corporate agendas of privatization, deregulation, and standardization. These organizations include charter support organizations um, at the national, state, and local level, venture philanthropies such as Gates, Walton, um, Broad, district support organizations for, um, like uh, in, in Chicago, uh, Renaissance 2010 or the Renaissance Schools Fund, uh, lobbying and astroturfing infrastructures like Stand for Kids or Stand for Children, um, which shares the same cast of characters as many of the right-wing think tanks, testing database projects designed to boil down the allegedly most efficient knowledge delivery systems and reward and punish teachers and students. These are not only at the center of pedagogical, curricular, and administrative reform, but unlike during the era of the hidden curriculum, they are openly justified through the allegedly universal benefits of capitalism. These are tactics designed to weaken teacher control over labor and set the stage for further profiteering with unions out of the way. Third, the new market bureaucracy imports into public schooling business expenses and rationales <coughs> that have financial and social costs. For example, public relations and advertising required of both public and privatized schools and real estate deals with chartering organizations funding for market-style competitions for private funds or public funds to implement corporate reforms such as Race to the Top, the Broad Prize, the Milken Prize, and so on. This third form of the new market bureaucracy involves the use of billions of dollars in private, found <clears throat> private foundation money, especially from the large venture philanthropists, to influence and steer public policy. And this foundation wealth, which is only possible through tax incentives, effects effectively redistributes control over public policy to private, super-rich individuals. Thus, the public pays to give away control over its own public institutions. So to sum up, we need to rethink the accusations of bureaucratic red tape that has been a core part of the neoliberal restructuring or corporate reform agenda. What most teachers and administrators experience in schools is a new market bureaucracy that has been installed and expanded under the guise of market efficiencies. Fisher offers a succinct and powerful antidote to the new market bureaucracy. He calls for demanding fulfillment of the promises for debureaucratization instilled through neoliberalism. In other words, for Fisher, we should take the neoliberal imperative for cutting bureaucratic red tape seriously, but direct this imperative toward the market-driven audit culture itself. In education, this means aiming to dismantle the market bureaucracy and its frenzied pursuit of ever more numerical representations of educational progress as part of a broader effort to reimagine public schooling as expanding the commons in which collective labor for collective benefit um, happens in schools and out. Yeah.